Hi, how's it going? All right, so uh, this may be a blast from the past here. We're going to have a, a, a brief uh, recorded lecture. Uh, please uh, also see uh, some notes uh, that I'm looking at here posted to the uh, Sikhai site. Okay, so uh, I wanted to give a brief overview of what we talked about from 5.1, some more details there, and uh, getting into the next bit of material, which is solving differential equations uh, using power series, finding power series form solutions to the equation. All right, so uh, you know we'll we'll need some some details on uh, these sort of expressions, power series, which are at first just formal sums, infinite infinite sum of uh, these little monomial pieces, x minus some given number x naught, called its center, uh, and then times some coefficients uh, a sub n, which are fixed real numbers. Okay, those two pieces of data, the center and the coefficients, determine the power series. Okay, <clears throat> the most useful uh, yeah, test for determining whether a power series converges is the, the ratio test. You know, there are a number of other tests for how or whether or not series converge, and uh, ratio test is the one that we'll, we'll need. So I mentioned this in class last week, but uh, here's what it says. Here's the, here's the content of the ratio test applied to uh, power series says the following. So if you compute this limit, remember again, if you're given a power series, you will know what the terms or the, the coefficients a sub n are, and you'll know what the center is. So you will be able to at least attempt to compute this limit, the ratio of absolute value, the n plus first coefficient divided by the nth coefficient times x minus x naught. Um, if that quantity, that limit is less than one, then the series converges absolutely uh, at the point x. So you think of x as some, you're, you're asking, does the series converge at a point x? You compute this limit, it's a number. If that number is less than one, the series converges absolutely there. Uh, and if it doesn't, if that limit is bigger than one, then the series diverges. It doesn't, doesn't define, not a well-defined number. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Let's think about this a little bit. Uh, so this limit, this very important limit here, <clears throat> which determines whether the series converges or diverges, or you know, by the way, if, if you're if you're not in this in the in one of these two cases, if the, you compute this limit is equal to one, then the ratio test doesn't say anything. Yeah, it will not be you know that this kind of issue will not be so important for us. It was maybe more important <clears throat> when you first learned about it. Uh, anyways, uh, going back to this limit, notice that uh, this quantity here, x minus x naught, it doesn't depend on n, so you can pull it through the limit. Doesn't matter. Same, same, same expression. Uh, and if we call this, so the the real important thing that you need to compute is the ratio of the limit of the ratio of successive coefficients. Let's call that L. And then notice that uh, you get uh, absolute convergence of the power series when x minus x naught is less than one over L. And just rework, you know, moving things around here. You know, the, the series converges if this limit up here is less than one. And so if you divide both sides by L, then that just says the series converges if x minus x naught in absolute value is less than one over L. Okay, so one over L is a very important number. It's called the radius of convergence because you have the following picture. <clears throat> You're centered at x naught and you can compute the limit uh, ratio of successive terms, all that capital L. Then you have the following picture. The power series will converge absolutely in this little interval centered about x naught from uh, you know, have it over here at x naught minus uh, one over L to x naught plus one over L, plus or minus the uh, radius of convergence, and the series diverges outside of that interval. So it's divergent if x is 
less than that number or greater than x naught plus one over L. And then on the in-between places, uh, the ratio test doesn't say. Okay, you'll you'll need more investigation if you want to learn uh, if your if your series converges there or not. <clears throat> Again, usually not uh, of much importance to uh, us in what we're about to do next. But we're just reviewing, you know, just to be clear, we're just removing uh, reviewing basic facts about power series. <clears throat> okay, uh, so power series, if you have a, a power series like this, uh, and it converges uh, absolutely, which we know will happen in a interval, which is uh, sometimes called the interval of convergence of the power series. You know, this is, this is exactly how uh, power series converge. They either converge on a, uh, within this interval or they diverge outside of it. So the set where it converges is very simple. It's just an interval. So we can talk about the interval of convergence. <clears throat> and where it converges absolutely, it defines a, a function. So on this interval from x plus or minus 1 over L, where L is the limit of the ratio of successive terms in the series, uh, successive uh, coefficients in the series, uh, you get a well-defined function. Okay, here I'm calling it f, but it's you know, a function. For instance, you can represent the function uh, e to the x, as we saw, by uh, the following simple looking power series, where the coefficients are 1 over n factorial. So just to be clear, if I write this out, this is like, uh, I write in red. Uh, this is a gigantic sum. Let me write out what the sums look like, the first couple of them. So if n is 0, I get 1 over zero factorial, which is one times x to the zero, which is just one. And then the next term would be if I plug in uh, one in for n, that would be a one times x. The next term would be if I plug in two in for n, a one over two factorial, that's just two uh, x squared. The next term would be one over three factorial, that would be six x cubed and so on. <clears throat> Okay, so now let's think about the situation for a little bit. When, uh, you know, the, the situation where you have a power series which is absolutely convergent and defines a function. Let's call that function f. Well, in this case, uh, you can do many good things. For instance, you can compute a derivative. The derivative of f, uh, well, that's the derivative of that power series. That's what f is. But then what's not obvious is that you can take the derivative inside of this infinite sum. And this is a, this is a true fact, true math fact, if uh, the series is absolutely convergent. You can take the derivative inside of the sum. And uh, so to compute the derivative of what's inside the sum, it's very simple. They're just monomials. So you compute a derivative. Uh, and that's just that n, you know, the n becomes this n. And then a sub n, whatever the coefficient was from before, times uh, x minus x naught to one, minus, one less power. I'm just taking a derivative of uh, uh, all these uh, terms. Notice uh, that the zeroth term goes away because that's just a constant. When n is zero, as we saw up at the top up here, uh, when n is zero, that, that term in the infinite sum is constant. So that when you take the derivative of it, it goes away, it's zero. And so that's why this new series is uh, starting with n is equal to one, because that zeroth term uh, goes away when you take a derivative. Okay, let's just see how this works for the exponential function, just to make sure it's uh, it's all making sense. It looks a little bit strange though, maybe. All right, let's take a derivative of the exponential function. Well, we know we know what that is, but uh, let's compute it using what we just. Uh, learned about taking derivatives of power series. Well, we know the series for e of the x. It has coefficients 1 over n factorial, centered at 0. OK, so let's take a derivative of each term. Now the power series becomes a sum from 1 to infinity, n times n factorial, or sorry, n times 1 over n factorial times x to the n minus 1. 
Okay, so I could cancel out the n. Yeah, the, this whole thing here is n times one over n times n minus one times n minus two. I thought that all the way down to one, and the n's cancel, and so this just becomes one over n minus one factorial. Just algebraic uh, simplification. Okay, so now uh, the next thing I want to do, I'm trying to recognize this as an exponential function. So I'm trying to recognize this derivative as uh, the same power series I started with. Well, to do that, uh, let's introduce uh, a new index. The, the letter n, by the way, there's just some uh, vocab. Vocab uh, in here, the, the letter n uh, is called the index of the sum. It's just the, it's the letter you're using to index which term you want to talk about. It's a label. Yes, what index usually means. Anyways, uh, so let's change that index. Uh, instead of talking about n, which goes from 1 to infinity, let's introduce a new index. Let's call that k, which is just a shift of the previous index. Uh, the value of k is just whatever the value of n was, minus 1. So if n was 1, k would be 1 minus 1, which is 0. So the sum now goes from uh, k equals 0 instead of n equals 1, because those are the same, same thing according to this, to this rule that we introduced. We got, the, we got to introduce the new index. That's our choice. I chose to uh, make a new index, which is the previous 1 minus 1. OK, so uh, wherever I see an n minus 1, I could replace that with a k. So 1 over uh, n minus 1 factorial becomes 1 over k factorial, and x to the n minus 1 becomes x to the k. And the sum now goes from 0 to infinity, as we just talked about. And now the, the actual letter we use in the expression is immaterial. It's just a bookkeeping device. So I might as well call that n again instead of k, just changing the letters. Um, and that still represents the same series. So. Uh, the sum with the, all these k's in there is the sum is the same as this sum with all the n's in there. It's a different n than the one from up there, uh, but the but the you know this is just notation for describing a sum, and the sums are the same. Okay, and this is uh, definitely the same as the power series for e to the x. And so what we just verified is that the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, as we already knew, but we did it using the you know, making sure that the, the rules for taking derivatives of power series was uh, coherent. OK, let's move on. All right, let's uh, take a look at this uh, fact again. Taking derivatives is the same as, uh, you know, <laughs> taking the derivative of a function, which is represented by an absolutely convergent power series, uh, can be computed by taking uh, derivatives in the terms of that sum in the power series and uh, looking at the resulting series. OK, so if we repeat this process, instead of taking just one derivative, do multiple derivatives, then if you, if you compute k derivatives, say, uh, let, let's, let's, k, uh, let's let k be um, some given whole number, uh, then computing k derivatives of this monomial will involve well, uh, the, if you take k derivatives of this monomial, you'll get a n from the first derivative, uh, n minus 1 from taking the derivative again of the resulting expression, and then n minus 2 when you take the third derivative, and so on, all the way down to uh, n minus k. These are the coefficients that you pick up. Let me write that down. These are the these things. These are the coefficients picked up from uh, using the power rule in computing 
derivatives. Okay, so now if I take this expression and I evaluate it at x naught, the center of the power series, then something special happens. Uh, the part of the series which involves x will go away most of the time for infinitely many terms. Uh, what, what should be here is x minus x naught, but if I plug in x naught in for x, this will just be zero unless the exponent is zero. So if I compute k derivatives, plug in uh, x naught into the function, all but one of the terms in the series will go away. And what you're left with is the very first term in the series, which is the kth term. I mean, it's the, it's the first term in the series. Uh, it came from the kth term of the power series for the original function. Anyway, if you, and this is all a little bit uh, fast, but it's not so important. We won't be using what I just said very often. Uh, but this is all to say that as a result of this, the kth uh, term in the power series, or uh, <laughs> the kth coefficient of the original power series, which appears on the right-hand side of this uh, thing that I just explained, uh, it has to be equal to the kth derivative of the function that the power series defines at the center, and then divided by k factorial because of the, all those uh, all these k terms came from they, all these numbers came from using the power rule k times. Okay, so if you have a uh, function. Uh, represented by a power series centered at x naught, then you know what those coefficients need to be. What, yeah, you know what the coefficients of that power series need to be. They need to be the, I mean, we just computed it up here. It's the, the, the nth coefficient will be, you compute the derivative of the function you're representing with the power series, n times, evaluated at the center x naught, and then you got to divide by n factorial because when you took those derivatives to get this formula of above. You had to use the power rule a bunch of times. That's where the n factorial comes from. OK, so the point is you can compute the terms in a power series in terms of derivatives of uh, the function it represents. And it works like this. This is called a, a Taylor series for f uh, centered at x naught. That's what this whole expression is. The warning is uh, for any given function f, uh, it may not be equal to its power series. That's a separate question. But for any function f, you can whose derivatives are well defined, you can compute this power series. Uh, and if f has a absolutely convergent power series, it's got to be this one. Anyway, that's all I want to say about that. So the point is. The general important lesson is that if you represent a function with an absolutely convergent power series, the terms in the series must be determined by the values of the derivative at the center you know, of, the, of the original function you're representing at the wherever you're centering the power series. Okay, let, let's look at some, some uh, examples of the Taylor series just to, uh, you know, they may come up soon. Uh, okay, so here are just examples of Taylor series. Here's the one for cosine, uh, which is centered at uh, zero. It will only involve actually uh, even powers of x, all of the odd powers. All the, all the odd coefficients in this power series will be zero. Um, and it will look like this. Uh, the zero term will be one. The second term will be minus one over two factorial and so on. Uh, there's no, no odd coefficients since if you take uh, an odd, derivative, an odd number of derivatives, 
uh, cosine of x. That's either plus or minus sine of x, depending on uh, yeah, if well, depending on what that odd number is, uh, and sine of x or sine of zero is zero. So when you're computing what the coefficients need to be, you compute them in terms of the derivatives of the underlying function cosine at the center, which is zero. That means you're computing either plus or minus sine at zero divided by however many derivatives factorial you're, you're looking at. And that will always be zero. So you only have the even terms represented here. And the even terms alternate in sine because the derivative of cosine alternates um, from plus and minus cosine, uh, depending on if you're computing uh, even number times two derivative, or if you're computing an odd number times two derivative cosine. Anyways, likewise, uh, the oh yeah, and you can write uh, you can write this uh, series uh, succinctly. Uh, using the following little trick here. Uh, I notice that the signs alternate in this power series and I'll encode that, you know, just this little notational trick. I'll encode that by writing minus one to the N. Notice as N changes from one to two to three to four, uh, minus one to the N will change from minus one to one to minus one to one and so on. Uh, this is how including a term like this, an expression like this in the power series encodes alternating sign. And then the other trick is if you only want uh, the even powers of X to show up in the power series, uh, well, you should start the sum from zero to infinity. And then to encode that you're only looking at even powers, you put the two N in the exponent of X. So as N ranges over all whole numbers, even the odd ones, uh, you'll see in this series all only even powers of x and no odd powers of x present. Okay, similar idea with the sine uh, of x. It has a power series like this. Uh, it will only have odd powers of uh, x in its power series for essentially the same reason that cosine only had even ones. Its terms also alternate in sine for the same reason as the derivatives of sine alternating between uh, plus and minus sine, depending on how many odd derivatives you're taking. Uh, and then to encode that I'm only summing over the odd powers of x, I use this trick. Uh, I'll put a 2n plus 1 in the exponent of x. So as n ranges over all whole numbers, even the even ones, x to the 2n plus 1 will range over all odd powers. Okay, that's, the, that's the point of this notation. Uh, so in this series, x here will range over all odd powers. Sorry. x to the 2n plus 1 will range over all odd powers. And never uh, you'll never see any even uh, power of x in the resulting expression. Okay, uh, uh, how about another one? Uh, last one here. Let's uh, compute uh, the power series for the Taylor series for uh, one over uh, one minus x in terms of, so yeah, as, as centered at, at, at a zero. As centered at x naught equals zero. Well, I won't. I won't uh, tell you what this is. Uh, you know, the previous ones I just kind of told you what they were with little explanation. Let's try and figure out what this one is. Well, to figure out what the the series for one over one minus x is, uh, I'll need to compute the derivatives in order to figure out the coefficients. Are. And I'll so I'll compute a bunch of derivatives, evaluate them at zero, uh, see what those are. They'll determine the coefficients by the rule that we just talked about up here. Okay. So let's start computing derivatives and see if there's a pattern. If I compute one derivative, I get a, you know, I'm using the power rule and the chain rule. I get a 
minus one from the power rule because I'm taking the derivative of one over something. And then I get an extra minus one from uh, taking the derivative of negative x in the denominator. So in total, I'll get positive one over uh, one minus x quantity squared. Let's take another derivative. Uh, something similar will happen, except I'll accumulate another power when I use the uh, power rule. So I'll accumulate a two and I'll get the positive sign because the same thing will, similar thing will happen as the previous one. And in general, as I compute more and more derivatives, I'll get the powers will, 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 will come up to the numerator uh, and they'll, they'll multiply. And in general, the nth derivative will be n factorial over one minus x to the n plus one. Okay, and so when you evaluate at x equals uh, zero, it just becomes n factorial. So this, the a n, the coefficient of the nth term in the Taylor series for one over one minus x centered at zero will be uh, f n at zero over n factorial. And as we can see from the formula we just came up with, this is n factorial over n factorial, and this is one. So this is the power series where all the coefficients are equal to one. Very simple. It's just a power series x to the n. But notice that uh, if you take a look at what the ratio test says, uh, you know, let's see where this thing converges. Uh, it will be absolutely convergent only for x is in between minus one and one. These other ones, by the way, uh, uh, sine and cosine, I didn't mention it, but uh, let me do that now. Uh, these series, these converge absolutely uh, for x is in anything. They, they, the radius of convergence is infinity. They converge everywhere, absolutely. Not so down here for one over one minus x, uh, which you could have expected since uh, when x is one, there's problems with this function. It's, uh, you know, the denominator is zero. So we could have expected that this power series is not going to, things are not gonna go good for it when, uh, when x is one. And that's actually, so the, the, I mean, that tells you that the radius of convergence cannot be larger than one. Uh, yeah. And by the way, it happens that the, the series will be convergent when X is minus one and not convergent when X is one as we just described. Okay, very good. Uh, let me just say one thing about uh, how to uh, rearrange power series by changing the index of a sum. <clears throat> Here's just another example. Suppose I have a power series that looks like this, standard looking power series centered at zero, co uh, coefficients a sub n. Well, I could, uh, you know, I could change the n to another letter k, uh, and in the same notation, I get the same sum. So this is the same as if I just changed the letter. The letter is immaterial because these are both representing like a number or a series, and that series or number is the same. Doesn't matter what letter you use in this notation. And by the way, I could uh, shift the sum. I could say, okay, uh, instead of n, or, you know, instead of k, let's look at k plus five. Call that. Uh, new index, uh, little n, and you could write, say this sum is the same as summing from five to infinity. And then the the little letters next to the, you know, what used to be a k is now an n minus five. So it's a sub n minus five to the, or sorry, times x to the n minus five. These all, all these three things represent the same power series, just with a different index. <clears throat> and by the way, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that these ends are the same thing. There's you know, 
they're not they're not supposed to be compared. Different indices and different series are not meant to be uh, equal to one another or anything like that. The n is not a variable, just to be clear. It changes in this expression. You know, it represents a you know it's a it's a placeholder, but it's not like a variable I'm plugging in per se. And that's why you can use the same letter in different ways to represent the same series. Okay, so the promise was that we're going to use power series to uh, be able to solve differential equations. Let's see how that works. Let's first uh, see how that works in a, in a simple case. <clears throat> All right, so let, let's let's look at probably the most simple uh, differential equation we know. This uh, linear, separable, or exact. Uh, I guess it's not exact, but this linear. Um, oh no, I guess it is also exact. But yeah, this is the, this is the most simple uh, equation. Uh, y prime equals y, and y at zero equals one. Let's try to solve this using a uh, power series formula. All right, so let's suppose we're looking for a solution to this initial value problem, uh, which is a power series, which converges absolutely about uh, a center x not equal to zero. Okay, you could have chosen to find a formula for the, the solution centered at some different point, but since we are given initial condition zero, or, you know, at x is equal to zero, <clears throat> it'll be most convenient to center the power series at that initial condition. That's basically what determines the, uh, where you centered the power series. Okay, so let's, let's look for a series uh, solution centered at uh, the origin. So, you know, just to be clear, I need to figure out you know, that what's the whole goal. Goal. Use the differential equation and initial condition to figure out what the coefficients are. You know, the power series is just determined by the coefficients. So to determine a power series solution, I need to figure out what the coefficients are. The only way I'm going to do that is use the differential equation. So let's describe how this process would work using differential equation to figure out what the coefficients are. It's a little bit tricky. Okay, well, let's look at the equation. It says y prime is equal to y. All right, I know how to take a derivative of an absolutely convergent power series. I differentiate each of the terms. So let's compute that. So this, this now says, um, I just took a derivative that the sum from n equals one to infinity of n times a n x to the n minus one is equal to uh, you know the the original power series because that's just what y is. Okay, got to remember that uh, you know I'm taking a derivative of a power series and the zeroth order term the derivative will just disappear so the sum only really makes sense if n is one only starting at when n is one. Okay, now I want to compare the left and right hand sides. So I should make them, I should shift these two uh, power series so that the, uh, the indices look the same and then I can combine them easily. Okay. Well, let's uh, do a shift of the index uh, down one. So that instead of starting at uh, n is equal to one, I will shift to n is equal to zero. So I'm changing n, the, the new, new n is equal to the old n minus one. So wherever I see an old n minus one, like here, I will replace that with n plus one minus one. So that's, that's just n, the new n itself. Uh, the old and seeing an old n down here, I should now put a new n plus one. And instead of having an old n there, I'll put a uh, new n plus one. 
right? So I've, I've re-indexed the sum on the left-hand side. And now both of the two sides are very comparable since they start at the same number, namely zero. All right, so I can subtract the two series from one another and I must get zero. So uh, that means that n plus one times uh, a sub n plus one minus the coefficients of the other side, n a n, uh, when I look at the, that difference, that must be zero. So that's exactly what I've written down here. n plus one times a sub n plus one is equal to a sub n for n equals zero, one, two, three, for all n's. That's the only way this power series is gonna be zero is if each of the coefficients is zero. Exactly what I've written down, which is exactly what we've learned. So I can kind of rewrite the initial value problem uh, in the following, well, oh, jump the gun, one, one second. Uh, let's also note that when I plug in zero in for y, or sorry, when I plug in x is zero into y, uh, the power series will look like the sum from zero to infinity, a sub n times zero to the n, which is zero except for the zeroth term. And since that, e that equals one, I know that I'll have to have a, my zeroth coefficient equal to one. So the initial condition in the uh, differential equation tells me what the zeroth term of the series must be. All right, so the, here's like a, we've reorganized the information of the differential equation, initial value problem, in terms of the coefficients entirely. The equation tells me that uh, the n plus first term or n plus first coefficient must be equal to the nth coefficient divided by n plus one. And the zeroth term uh, will have to be one. And in this way, we can calculate, oh, what is, uh, you know, what, what all the other terms will be. So for instance, um, well, the zeroth term is one. And to figure out what the uh, end, uh, first term is, I'll look at this rule. Uh, for n is equal to zero. I will then say that a sub zero plus one, aka a sub one, is equal to a sub zero, aka one divided by uh, one, which is one divided by one, that's one. Uh, let's see how that works for the second coefficient. I will look at the general rule for uh, n is equal to one. That tells me that a sub two is equal to a sub one, which is one, divided by one plus one, which is two. So one over two. And as you go on, you keep on saying, okay, I, I figured out so many coefficients so far. Uh, what's the next one? Well, I look at this formula. It tells me exactly how to compute the next one from the previous one. And in general, I'll find that the nth term is one over n factorial. <clears throat> And that's uh, what we expected. So that gives you a power series uh, where the coefficients are uh, one over n factorial, that's e to the x, which is the solution to the initial value problem. So this is how this process works, finding a power series solution to differential equation. Well, now let's do something a little bit uh, more adventurous. <clears throat> the section 5.2. Uh, series solutions to uh, second order differential equations near so-called ordinary points. Let's see what this is all about. So let's uh, let's take a look. Let's try to solve a differential equation, second order linear. So things we've studied a little bit of before. Uh, we've studied co constant coefficients, you know, linear second order equations a lot. But let's let's take a look at a more general scheme where uh, you have coefficients uh, p, q, and r that depend on the variable x. So where p, q, and r are some given, given functions of x. Okay, um, so a point x naught is called an ordinary point of this uh, equation if the coefficient of the second order term, the top, the highest order is non-zero there. So ordinary point if 
the thing next to the y prime prime is not zero at that point. And if it is equal to zero, it's called a singular point. The equation will have a very different flavor. Centering a power series, uh, power series centered at x naught will have a very different uh, flavor depending on if that is an ordinary or singular point for the differential equation. Okay, so let's uh, let's let's go through the process we just uh, explored in this slightly more complicated scenario. Here's a fundamental example. Okay, again, something that we know how to solve already, but let's uh, it'll it'll be a very illuminating to uh, see how this works uh, for finding power series solution. Okay, let's look at the constant coefficient equation y prime prime plus y equals zero. So since there's no function in front of the uh, uh, y prime prime, which is the function one, it's non-zero, so every point is an ordinary point. Okay, anyway, so let's look at a, uh, let's try to find a power series uh, solution centered at zero. So let's assume we have an absolutely convergent power series that solves this equation, and let's try to find uh, what that series is. So just to be clear, the goal, as usual, as before, uh, Goal, find a sub n by looking at the differential equation and seeing what it says about the coefficients. OK, so let's look at the, what the uh, second derivative is. Well, I know what the first derivative is. It's the sum from n plus or uh, n equals 1 uh, to infinity of n times a sub n times x to the n minus 1. We've got to compute a second derivative, so let's just do that again. Now the, the first term in this big sum will vanish when I take another derivative, since now it would, would be constant, so I need to start at n is 2. So now n goes from 2 to infinity, uh, and then it, the things I'm adding up are n times n minus 1 times uh, a sub n times x to the 2 powers below what it started out as, so that's a n minus two. Just use the power rule and differentiated each term uh, the usual way. And just notice that the first term in the previous sum, when I take a derivative of it, that will go away. So I should start the sum at two instead of one. Then now let's re-index. Uh, so, you know, re-index the sum where I'll say that the new uh, n, the new index, is equal to the old index um, minus 2. So when the old sum started at 2, the new sum will start at 0. And wherever I see an old n, I'll put an n plus 2 instead. So now the coefficients become uh, n plus 2 times n plus 1 times a sub n plus 2. And the Monomials are now just x to the n instead of that shift. OK, nice. So we just wrote the second derivative as a power series starting at uh, n is equal to 0. Now, whoops, I got the typo here. <clears throat> so now let's look at the equation and see what that tells us about uh, you know, how the coefficients are related to one another. So computing the derivative, or you know, I'm just computing the left-hand side of the equation uh, as a power series, the coefficient would be, since I've already done the work of shifting the index, uh, that'll be the thing from the y double prime term, which I just computed over here. That's n plus 2 times n plus 1 times a sub n plus 2. And then the coefficient plus the coefficient of the power series for y, which is a sub n. This whole thing's got to be zero. That's what the equation says. And the only way an absolute conversion power series is equal to zero is if, uh, you know, identically equal to zero as a function, is if each coefficient is zero. And so these things have to all be equal to zero. And just the uh, rearranged, that means that, uh, you know, it's solving for n plus two. I get uh, minus a sub n divided by this thing here, which is uh, n plus 2 plus n times n plus 1. 
Okay, so this is what the differential equation says about the terms in the series. This is just to, to be clear, this is for n equals zero, one, all the ends. Notice something a little bit funny. Uh, any term, any coefficient, a sub n, in the power series for y will determine not the next term, but two terms in the future. That's just what the equation tells us. It doesn't tell us how to compute a term from the previous term. It tells us what it, you know, what it was in terms of a term two terms ago. Well, let's just see what it see what it says. Uh, so let's let's see what it says for like a, when n is zero. Let's see what this equation says. Well, it says that uh, a sub two is equal to a sub zero divided by two times one. That's two times one. Okay, interesting. Let's see what it says for uh, the next one. So now that I know what a sub two is, this formula will tell me what a sub four is. Let's see what it is. Uh, well, it says that it'll be, and we're using n is equal to two. Since we know what a sub two is, we'll figure out what a sub four. So it says that a sub four is equal to minus a sub two, and then divided by uh, four times three, four times three. So that's equal to, now you know, using the fact that I know what a sub two is, uh, positive, typo there, positive a sub zero divided by four factorial. I got the sign wrong here. Oops. Now, if I uh, go to the next one, okay, what, what if I, I take n is equal to four? Now that I know what a sub four is, I can figure out what a sub six is. Well, the formula says it will be a negative a sub four divided by six times five. So that's what these two numbers are. And so I get a negative a sub zero divided by six factorial. And that's what will happen in general. Uh, any even coefficient, a coefficient where the little index is an even number, will be given by uh, negative one to the k, the index divided by two, divided by two k factorial times a sub zero. Alternating signs, and I get a factorial in the denominator corresponding to what term I'm talking about. And then the a sub zero just comes along for the right. That'll be um, just determined by the value of the solution at zero. I didn't give initial conditions here, so uh, we, won't, we won't determine what that is. Okay, here's a, here's a side remark. Uh, how do, <laughs> so I just kind of jumped ahead to this. You know, I computed the first three terms and then I said, oh, here's the general term. How do I know that? You know, rigorously. You know, just kind of noticing a pattern is not quite good enough for uh, mathematical rigor. Uh, so how do I how do we know that uh, rigorously that that is indeed a formula for the uh, two kth term of the power series solution to this equation? Well, let's see. So uh, here's how you do it. Uh, this won't be necessary for us to do rigorously, but I'm just telling you for your own knowledge. Well, um, let's assume it's true for some value of k. Now let's assume this formula is a true formula for some whole number k. Yeah, we know it's true for some k. Yeah, I computed the first three of them. So we know, we know this expression is true for some k. So let's see what, it, what that means. Well, if this is a correct formula for some k. Then let's go back to the, you know, the identity up here that determines what the coefficients are. And we say, okay, uh, well, then if I know the formula for uh, a sub 2k, well, then the formula tells me what a sub 2k plus 2 is. It's uh, minus a sub 2k divided by 2k plus 2 times 2k plus 1. I just wrote down this formula for n is equal to 2k. Just wrote that down. And well, since I'm assuming the formula is true at the level k, you know, for stage k, 
uh, then I can write down what uh, ne uh, negative a sub 2k is. It's, it's this expression here. All right, and then if I simplify that a little bit, uh, it looks like minus one to the k plus one power times a sub zero divided by two times k plus one factorial. So putting everything together, that says this, that the next even term in the sum will indeed be the right form. It'll be negative one to the one higher than k divided by two times one higher than k factorial times a naught. So if I know the formula for some value of k, then I know it for the next value of k. This is called a mathematical induction. Now, since I know that it holds for uh, uh, some values of k, you know, I know the formula is correct for k is equal to one, for instance, I just check that manually. Uh, and I've just shown that knowing the formula at some stage for some value of k implies the formula for the next k. It's like uh, I got a domino of uh, domino effect going on here. Uh, I know that if I know if the formula is correct for some k, that will imply it for the next value of k. So I know that if one domino falls over, it will push the next one over. And I also know that the first domino is pushed over because the formula is true for k is equal to one. So I know that one domino will make the next one fall. And I know that I pushed over the first domino. Therefore, all of the dominoes fall over. OK, which is to say that the statement is true for all values of k. That's how you rigorously show uh, formulas like that from the rule that we got from the differential equations. Again, not something I would expect you to do yourself on homework without being specifically asked to. All right, if we go through the same process for the odd ones, if I started from uh, n is equal to one instead of n is equal to zero, so this is, this is using the formula star with n is equal to one as the starting point instead of n is equal to zero as the starting point, then I get a similar formula. I get the, uh, the even terms, a sub uh, 2k minus one, sorry, the odd terms, what am I saying? a sub 2k minus one uh, have a very similar flavor, negative one to the k divided by 2k minus one factorial times the first term, which I don't know, but is determined by the initial condition. So together, you know, if I split the power series for y into a even part, and the odd powers. Notice that as n ranges over all whole numbers here, 2n will range over all even numbers. And as n ranges from uh, 1 to infinity over all numbers between 1 and infinity, uh, 2n minus 1 will range over all odd numbers. That's why I have included these expressions in the, in the series, because as n ranges over all whole numbers between 1 and higher, uh, 2 n minus 1 ranges over every single odd number starting at 1 or higher. Okay, uh, and now if you remember from a little bit ago, this is the power series for cosine centered at 0, and the odd terms give you the power series for sine centered at 0. And then there's coefficients out in front a sub zero for the even terms, a sub one for the odd terms. Uh, they are just proxies for the initial conditions of y and y prime at x is equal to zero. OK, and this is what we knew already. Now we could have solved this constant coefficient second order equation using the uh, other way. Uh, but this is just illustrating how this process works. Okay. All right, I think that's enough for now. And we'll uh, continue with the rest uh, in the next class. All right, thank you very much for your attention. And I'll see you uh, Wednesday soon.
All right.